Welcome to the Fun Astrology Podcast. It is Friday, July 15th. We're going to talk about Saturday the 16th, Sunday the 17th, and some of your questions all today. So let's roll into this quickly, taking a look at the sky up over our heads. We are in the after effects of Wednesday's full moon in Capricorn. That luminary has moved on through Aquarius and today at 4.18 this morning, moves into Pisces. We get a spiritual moon over the weekend. The other big aspect tomorrow that you're probably feeling today is Mercury on that sun. Has not there been a lot of interesting communication even since the full moon? Yeah. And I'm leaving interesting for your own interpretation. <laughs> it's been interesting. Last quarter moon tomorrow as well already, yes. Ray Merriman's expected newsletter tomorrow. We will do that. And then on Sunday, those other two trines to Neptune that we've been talking about, Mercury in the morning at 3.52 a.m., the sun in the evening at 6.55 p.m., and then at 9.30 tomorrow night, Venus enters Cancer. I've got a little bit of a pileup of listener questions here, so let's have some fun. Hello, my name is Raul. How do you address steliums? Um, how do they affect your zodiac houses and zodiac signs? Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening, Raul. Great question. And the first thing, the audiobook narrator in me comes up and says, how do you correctly pronounce the word? It is purely an astrological terminology. There is no other word in the dictionary. Now, Delia, one of our readers, Delia Golden, mentioned to me a booklet called The Pronunciation Guide for Astrologers and Astronomers. I'm like, ah, got to have it. Found a used edition. I almost have to just carefully open it because it is so frail. But it was published in the early 1970s by the American Federation of Astrologers. And it doesn't have it. <laughs> I'm like, oh, no. It also doesn't have Kazemi. So I'm like, that needs a revision. So that wasn't helpful. So I think it's potato, potato. As far as if you want to say stelium or stellium, I first heard it as stellium. Robert says stelium. I looked up a couple of others. Chris Brennan says stellium. And Chris, if you'd like to check out an in-depth two-plus-hour podcast on this, check out the Astrology Podcast Episode 311, it was released in the summer of 2021, and it's entitled Stelliums in Astrology, Interpreting Planetary Clusters. Obviously, I'm going to take a quick stab at it, but they do a much better job of going deeper. Another thing about this is how do we define what comprises a stellium? And I've heard three or more planets, four or more planets. Some people say five or more planets in a sign or a house. So I guess there's no consensus on definition either. I've always gone with three. Why? Because I have three. Well, really, I have four, but three is the main focus. So I can speak to personal experience. Three to me is a stellium. I think that you have to combine them. Mine are the sun, Mars, and Neptune. They are all on the same degree in Scorpio. So as I was playing with that, I realized I had three combined energies into one flashlight beam of energy, if you will, or even laser beam of energy. So really, it wasn't the sun and Mars and Neptune. So I had to combine them to get it in my mind. So I call it my Marsan tune. It's one body. It's Mars, the sun, and Neptune all just intermingled. Stelliums can really take over your chart and thus your life. You've heard force of nature, but I can tell you this, once you understand yours, then you can really make some dramatic progress on your life. It's that powerful. So I would suggest that you check out Chris and Patrick's podcast. You have to look at how far apart those planets are and are they even changing signs within a house, etc. There are so many interpretive things but in essence, try to get to a point where you're combining them into one unified energy and see what that looks like. Play it out against your life, and I think you'll find some really interesting stuff. Hi there, Thomas. This is Lisa, and I'm just looking to see if you have any advice as to how exactly one would figure out their astrology chart if they were born, let's say, as per their mother, just a little after midnight. Um, unfortunately, not all of us have the exact time. So just curious what your advice would be for someone who has only that information to go on. Thanks so much. Lisa, I love this because I really don't think it has sunk in yet how important the whole idea of accurate birth time is. All right, so let me give you a couple of factors. Number one, 
in a labor and delivery room. I've had nurses tell me both sides of this. Yes, we really are paying attention to the clock. And no, there's no way, especially in a crisis situation where we're either trying to save the mother's life, the baby's life, an emergency surgery, many other things are going on. So sometimes the hospital record can be to the minute exact, and then sometimes there's a little bit of adjustment. So how wide of a variance do we have to play with? It's exactly four minutes. That can make a huge difference, especially in the progressed charts. Lisa, I actually had the same situation. My mom always said around 8.30. Well, as I got more into astrology, that wasn't good enough. So I went to the guy that I recommend everybody to, Joseph at HarmonicLife.com. He has developed his own software, and he rectified my time to 8.22. Now, that didn't change anything structurally in my chart. It didn't change any of the house positions, but it did change those progressions. Then, over on Old Soul, New Soul with Robert Glasscock, we talked about it in our third episode, and I have another much longer one coming. In fact, I'll try to release that one right away. That'll be the next release. So it gives you a technique that you can use major life events, particularly those that occurred before the age of 30. However, it does sync up for later in life events as well. But it's a way that you can dial it straight in by adjusting the midheaven to bring those events into direct alignment with the midheaven. In fact, Robert and I have talked about this. It is so important that we are going to do a little video course where you can see the technique in action. As soon as we get the time, we're going to put that out and have it for you soon. Hopefully in the next well, month to six weeks, I'm hoping. So I would recommend Joseph or I would recommend Robert's Technique. Now this one's a little hard to swallow because until you get that birth time, you have to be very careful reading that chart. Now obviously the big pieces will be in place, but that ascendant could change and that changes the whole house structure. If you have a moon that's on the edge of a sign change, you could change that, which dramatically changes things. So you really have to be careful. It's just best. I would highly recommend HarmonicLife.com. Email Joseph. Get in touch with him. I send him everybody. He did a great job for me. He'll take good care of you, and you can get a chart rectification and then use Robert's technique to dial it in further from there. Robert's technique is good if you're dealing with minutes or let's say 15 minutes or 30 minutes even. Obviously, the tighter the better, but it's not as good or relevant for a bigger picture analysis. It could be, but it's a little more difficult. Now, here's the thing about the birth time importance. Astrology is based on the beginning, the genesis of a thing. And I know, especially with some of the recent events in the United States, this has come to forefront again. When does that begin? Well, the general accepted astrological interpretation is obviously at the time that you take your first breath. For astrology, that's the accepted birth time. But for example, a company, when would its birth chart be? Well, typically it's the opening of the session of the first day it starts trading on a stock exchange if it's public. If it's private, it could be when you sign the incorporation papers. A marriage has a birth chart. Interesting question. When would that begin? Would it begin during the ceremony, which is just a ceremony, or would it really be when you officiate the documents? And then, obviously, an event chart would be based on the time that something happens. A traffic accident, for example. Well, if you're fortunate enough to be able to just look at your watch right there, then you can tell exactly the time of that and use that as an event chart. But the whole system is based on a precise moment in time and space when the heavens move around an earthly event to paint a picture of the outcomes and characteristics of that event. So don't minimize it. That's the main point. Hi, Thomas. This is Stephanie, a longtime listener and fan. The song by the Fifth Dimension um, about the dawning of the age of Aquarius, uh, let the sunshine in. I was wondering about those lyrics. What on earth do they actually have anything to do with Aquarius? When the moon is in the seventh house, okay, not Aquarius, and Jupiter aligns with Mars, I'm not Aquarius, then peace will guide the planets and love will steer the stars. Okay, well, that's great. But I don't see how those other, the moon or the Jupiter aligning with Mars, I don't know how that has anything to do with Aquarius. I was wondering if you would like to enlighten us all. All right, thank you. You bet, Stephanie. 
they did a lot of drugs back in the 60s. <laughs> That's what I got to say about that one. Great question. I love this. What a great way to wrap up and launch into the weekend. But we weren't in the age of Aquarius yet and still aren't, I don't think. So that Piscean propensity for drugs is certainly still there. Obviously, the song was written as part of a Broadway musical entitled Hair. The reason it was called Hair is they come out and clip the hair off, some hair, a lock of hair off of one of the main characters, light it on fire and throw it into a trash can. All forms of the production and movie have been a runaway success. The off-Broadway production started in 1967. It moved on to Broadway in 1968. The song, of course, by the Fifth Dimension that defined an era almost was released in 1969. Interestingly, the song holds Billboard's greatest song of all time position number. You ready for this? Think about Aquarius. Position number 66. Hey, look it up. It's online. <laughs> Oh, my. So back to the musical. I mean, you got to look at the context in which this was written. This was released in 1967. You remember, we've talked about this relative to the north node, south node position, which was identical back then. That south node in Scorpio, the long, hot summer of 1967 with all the race riots. Think of every body bag that was coming back from Vietnam. If you were a male teenager during that era, you had Vietnam to look forward to. The huge desire for peace, the free love, the drugs that were flowing. I mean, the whole musical itself is about drugs. Really, escapism. Now, I'm going to argue that the age of Aquarius, as the song is describing, is not going to be so wonderfully glorious as this basically drug-induced depiction of nirvana might be. People at that time wanted anything but what was almost inevitably unchangeable in their world. Drugs were the escape. They never really are, but it seemed that way. And that was what they were singing. We are the kids who have had enough, and we want something better. But no, the words about the moon in the seventh house and Jupiter aligning with Mars was never the result of consulting with Robert Glasscock, Linda Goodman, or Steve Forrest nor do they have any claim to royalties <laughs> as a result. But you can really feel the emotion even in the second little chorus here. Harmony and understanding, sympathy and trust abounding. No more falsehoods or derisions. Golden living dreams of visions. Mystic crystal revelation and the mind's true liberation. You can feel their hidden pain, can't you? And under that same nodes of the moon axis under which this song was written and those words, those emotions came forth, aren't we getting a lot closer to that again today? History is repeating itself. We're not seeing the answers. We're feeling trapped. We don't trust our leadership. And we just want to go hide. What I am hoping, and in fact this week in the Robert Glasscock practicum that we did, we looked at the symbolism in the chart of spiritual revival being the answer to this current dilemma. And it is in the chart. A revival of astrology is in the chart. So that's why we keep doing what we're doing. Healing convergence, sharing love, pointing to true spirituality as the only answer to our dilemma. If we find it, it will be nirvana and it will be pure and it will be non-drug induced. It will be natural, the natural high that comes from a close connection to our true source. That is what the chart looks like today. The question is, will the culture go down the escapism path or will it do the work and find the higher ground? Now, we'll wrap up here with, well, when is it coming? And you know what? This is something that I think, sadly, astrologers are in such disagreement that it's almost embarrassing. These macro ages that are talked about, the Pisces that we're in now, Aquarius coming, are all part of the precession of the equinoxes, which we've talked about on here before. It is a very slow 25,800-year wobble of the Earth's axis. If you divide that 25,800 by 12, you get approximately 2,150 years. The question is, when did the age of Pisces begin? And that's where things start to vary widely. 
all the way from about 850 B.C. up to 1447 A.D. Now I'm going to give you a bottom line kind of answer. Cut to the chase. So the shift from Pisces to Aquarius will begin when the beginning of our tropical zodiac, the spring equinox, the March equinox, moves out of the constellation Pisces and into the constellation Aquarius. But neither astronomers nor astrologers have a definitive answer on when that will be. I also don't think it will be the utopia that was sung about back in the late 1960s because Aquarius itself represents a struggle between authoritarianism and fierce self-independence. So while that will define a, an upcoming 2,000-year period of history, we will get a little bit of a look at that over the next 20 years when Pluto moves into Aquarius. But that will not be the age of Aquarius. Stephanie, thank you. You guys are the best listeners, and you ask great questions. Three really good ones. Appreciate it all, and have a wonderful weekend. I will see you back tomorrow for some financial astrology. The market took a big hit yesterday. We'll talk about it. Have a great day.